but I'm grateful for our children's ministry here. The Sunday nights have been a great encouragement when we've had, I'm talking about just children, sometimes around 50. Then we have youth and we have adults here too. So we're probably running pretty close to what we are on Sunday morning, but it's separated into different groups. That's okay too. So if you wonder if we have Sunday school, we do. It's on Sunday night. Nobody said we had to do it on Sunday morning. And I have thoroughly enjoyed that. I really have. Well, I think we've got one more book to go through in our uh, lessons that we got from Answers in Genesis. And uh, talking about the life of David right now. But that has nothing to do with what we're going to talk about this morning. Take your Bible and turn to Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 25. I told you last week that I was going to preach on heaven. That's what I'm going to do. And hopefully I'll give you some ammunition for people that come up to you and say, well, we just don't know what it's going to be like. Yes, we do. And this passage will show us that very clearly. Listen to what the apostle has to say in verses 18 to 25. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together till now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly awaiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. Let's ask the Lord to bless this Scripture. Father, thank you for this passage. I realize it's in the middle of this chapter, but I think the apostle wants us to clearly see that in spite of all of the suffering, in spite of all the difficulty, in spite of all of the hardships that we might face, that is nothing compared to what awaits us. Use this time, Father, to encourage your people and glorify yourself. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. We just finished a study of the Gospel of Mark. And in the ending of Mark, we saw that Jesus ascended up into heaven. And if you remember, I brought it to your attention that the text says heaven singular, not plural. Usually when you see the word heavens, it's talking about the planets, the stars, and that up there. But it said heaven singular, and that's a blessed place for all believers in Jesus Christ to spend eternity. Jesus said in John 14 that he was going to prepare for us a place and then come back and get us. That is true without any mixture of error. What can we look forward to? in this place called heaven. Paul makes it clear that it's not only us, but the whole creation groans to be released from the slavery of corruption. Because see, sin cursed creation, not just man and woman. Nothing on this earth has not been touched by sin. And because of this, heaven promises us that we will be released from this slavery to sin. You might remember this little reminder of what is in the future for the church of Jesus Christ. When we're saved, we're saved from the penalty of sin. That means that when you close your eyes for the last time on this planet, if you are a child of God, you will not stand before God and be judged for your sin. That's already been judged. Jesus Christ willingly took 
our sin upon himself. We are saved from the penalty of sin. What is the penalty of sin? Well, I think you know from reading the scriptures, it is to be separated forever from God in a place the Bible calls hell. But that's not all. When we're saved, we're saved from the penalty of sin. That means we no longer fear the judgment of God. As I mentioned, God poured that out on his son. That's called justification. Once we're saved, the Holy Spirit begins the work of sanctification in us. We're being saved from the power of sin. You should be more victorious over sin today than you were yesterday. And the longer you walk with Jesus Christ, your sins will change. You're wondering what I mean by that, don't you? Well, I'm glad. You're going to wonder. But the point of that is, the closer you get to Jesus Christ, the closer you get to the end of this journey, the sins change. Maybe when you were younger, you couldn't stay away from the bottle or the can or the cigarettes or whatever. But the closer we get to the finish line, those things no longer seemingly have a pull on us like they once did. And I could say much about that. But the Holy Spirit has began the work of making us into the image of Jesus Christ. That doesn't mean we're going to have long hair and wear a robe and that sort of thing. What it means is that His character will be seen more clearly in us the closer we get to that finish line. It's a lifelong endeavor. And on the day, and it was a glorious day when I was saved, I hope it was for you, but it's going to be a glorious day when we arrive in heaven and we're finally saved, hallelujah, from the presence of sin. It won't be there. And I'll tell you, let your imagination Go a little crazy here because if you can imagine a place with no sin, then you're talking about this place we call heaven. This is called glorification. So you got justification saved from the penalty of sin, then you got sanctification saved from the power of sin, and then you've got glorification saved from the presence of sin. No, that's not original with me. But it's true. It's scriptural. In the Christian life, we're saved from the penalty of sin, the power of sin, and finally the presence of sin. And like I said, you may not can imagine what this would be like, but I sure can. Let us immerse ourselves in this passage so that we might gain a new appreciation for the place we will spend eternity. There are four reassurances in this passage that will help us look forward to heaven more than ever. Let's look at the first one. It's in verse 18. Paul makes a comparison very personal. Notice what he says. He begins with these words, For I consider. The King James says, I reckon. I know you thought that was just a southern word. But it's a biblical term also. I reckon. Do not be mistaken. Paul is not relying on public opinion when he says this. The word translated consider or reckon comes from the accounting world. When an accountant finds the sum of numbers, he or she puts their reputation on the correctness of that sum. And Paul is saying that after researching both sides of the issue, he puts his reputation on what is about to follow. And notice what he says, the sufferings of this present time. Now that could refer to the time in which Paul lived. Or it could refer to any time in history. William Gearing in his book, The Glory of Heaven, gives this list of sufferings that will not be in heaven. Are you ready? Reproaches. Now that's an old biblical term. I'm not going to explain what it is, but nobody likes to be reproached. 
cruel mockings. Anyone ever made fun of you for being a child of God, for praying over a meal, for carrying your Bible? Cruel mockings, scourgings. Now, I don't think any of us have actually been beaten for being a child of God. Revilings. People revile at you when they say all manner of evil against you. Trouble. No, now that's coming closer to home. We all know what that is. And that comes in all kinds of sizes and shapes, doesn't it? Trouble. You say, Brother Keith, what do you mean? Trouble. That's what I mean. Of any kind. He goes on and says pain. Now, I'm going to ask you a dumb question. How many of you have ever felt pain? How many of you are feeling it right now? There won't be any of that in heaven. There won't be any. Diseases. I found out just this past week that I have a fellow living in me that I didn't know about. His name is Arthur Ritus. And you can say what you want. I was hard on my body when I was younger. Most of us were. We would play football or baseball or something like that. I used to ride dirt bikes. And if you've ever seen anybody ride a dirt bike, that will beat you to death. Hunger. Very few times in my life have I been hungry. But the times that I was, I didn't like it. Cold. Well, we live in Florida. We don't have to worry too much about that unless the temperature gets below 70. By, by the way, it's 71 in here right now. Nope, I'm sorry, it's 69.4. If you're cold, we have these things on the back of the benches. You can use those if you'd like. Nakedness. Now, that doesn't mean just going around naked like they do at certain beaches. I'm talking about having your clothes taken from you, not having anything to put on. Perils, loss of liberty, or loss of life itself. That's the list Gearing gives in the list of suffering. And Paul says none of these can compare to the glory that is to be revealed. So to place our sufferings on one side of the scale and glory on the other, glory would far outweigh the sufferings. <coughs> and Paul says this glory has yet to be revealed. And if you're a child of God, if you're walking with Christ, you long for this. You may not know it all the time. You may not feel it all the time. But most of the time, there's a longing in you for something more. Something better. We look forward to it, but we do not know for sure exactly what it is. But I promise you, according to the word of God, when you get there, you will know what it is. Trust me on that. Now, some translations in this text say when Paul says the are not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. Some translations say to us, others say in us. Which is it? Yes. It can be either one. Paul makes it clear that it's far better than what we have now. You say, but how is this so? Well, let's use our glorified, our sanctified imaginations for just a moment, okay? It's okay to do that. And at the end of this sermon, I'll give you a scripture that tells you that. The new earth, we're talking about that John says, I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven to what? A new earth. It's been redone. Everything has been taken away and new put on it. You say, how does God do that? The same way he did when he created it. It's not a problem for him. You say, well, could that be a nuclear holocaust? I don't think so, but it could be. But God is in charge of that. Just let him deal with it. However it happens, the new earth will be similar to this one in form. And let me give you a few things about it 
it's not my idea, they're the scripture's idea. There will be rivers and lakes, but no sea. Now, for those of you that like to go to the beach, this may hurt your heart. But notice in Revelation 21.1, it says no sea, singular. It does not say no seas. You say, well, what are you saying? What I'm saying is, was John talking about a particular sea? In the middle of Israel is the Sea of Galilee. It's not huge, but it's bigger. Well, it's bigger than anything else inside the nation of Israel. But when you go to the west, what happens? You get to the Mediterranean Sea, and it's bigger than the Sea of Galilee, and it's a monster anyway. That's all there is to it. There will be rivers and lakes, but no sea. Am I convinced that there won't be any oceans at all? No, I'm not. The scripture does not say that. It says there's not going to be, there's only going to be no sea. Now, the, he did not say plural, seas. Use your imagination there. Because what does salt water do? It corrodes everything. It corrodes your skin, too. And if you're very, very thirsty, <laughs> you don't want to drink salt water. So there's some bad things affiliated with that. Of course, I know we like to go to the beach and hear the surf to see that big open and just imagine what was God thinking when he made this? Well, we can ask him when we get there, but there's more. There will be travel on the new earth. Isaiah 2, verse 3, listen. And many peoples will come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us concerning his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For the law will go forth from Zion, and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. You can't get to Jerusalem except by travel. And it's a new Jerusalem. It's not going to look like this one. If you've been to the Holy Land and you've seen it, just forget about that picture because the new one doesn't look like that. There will be no war. Isaiah 2 verse 4, just the next verse down. And he will judge between the nations and will render decisions for many peoples and they will hammer their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nation will not lift up sword against nation and never again will they learn war. I hope that encourages you. Because probably every person in here has been touched by at least one war. Some have lost children, brothers, uncles, even moms, dads. But there won't be any of that in heaven. There won't be any of that on the new earth. There will be no killing. Period. Not just no murder. No killing at all. Isaiah 11 verse 6. And the wolf will dwell with the lamb. And the leopard will lie down with the young goat. And the calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little boy will lead them. Can you imagine? Telling your child to go play out in the yard and he comes back carrying a rattlesnake. And the rattlesnake won't bite him. The wolf will dwell with lamb. I, Michael and I were watching a some kind of documentary on TV yesterday, and it was about the one of the deltas down in Africa. And folks, they didn't pull any punches when a lion took down a an impala, which is kind of a deer looking critter. When the lion took him down, they showed it. It was not pleasant. And I thought about it. There are guys in this church that like to hunt white-tailed deer, turkey, hog, and so forth. And folks, there's nothing wrong with that. But there won't be any of that. 
You say, why? You won't need to. You won't need to. You say, well, you think I need to today? Well, Richard, some of us feel like we need to, don't we? That's right. But there won't be any of that. Folks, I can tell you this from experience. I'm sure Richard and some of the other guys in here that hunt, every time I put my scope on a deer, I get nervous, shaky. And if it's a deer with a big rack, it's worse. You say, why is that? There's something in man that doesn't want to have to kill unless he has to. And I could talk about that. But I'm going to stop there because I don't want to give everything away. There is much more. But let's go on to number two. In verses 19 to 22, Paul shows the past, present, and future of creation. We're not the only ones that long for a better world. Creation does the same. Because you see, creation has been under a curse also. You say, well, Keith, what was creation cursed with? The ground was cursed. We live in Florida. Every one of us knows what a sand spur is. And I have been told, I think I've shared this with you before, that a farmer that lives on the other side of the county told me that someone from the University of Florida had told him that a sand spur, which is the seed of the sand spur plant, by the way, can lie in the ground nine years and still come up after that. Doesn't that just make you want to go out and collect sand spurs? I know it does. The ground is cursed, so it brings forth sand spurs, thistles, thorns, weeds. Also, we have poison ivy, <laughs> poison oak, poison this, poison that. And if you have a garden of any kind, you have to till, plow, or disc, and weed before you can grow anything on it. And then after a farmer plants, he still fights weeds. In Missouri, when we lived there, and I worked for a farmer, when we went to pick corn, there was a beautiful plant there with a stalk about that big around that went way up out of the corn and had a pretty little sunflower on it. And that's what they called them. But it would plug up a combine like that. Weed. If you're a farmer or if you've ever done any farming of any kind, you know about fighting weeds of all kinds. And that's just the ground that's cursed. Creation also waits, and that's what Paul says here, for the revealing of the sons of God. What does that mean? Creation is waiting for our redemption to be finalized also. It's waiting to see that. You say, what are the sons of God? That's the sons belonging to God. It has nothing to do with gender. And he goes on and says, creation was subject to futility. Futility means what is devoid of truth and appropriateness. And that was the plan of God. But, <laughs> there is a but there. Creation will be set free from slavery to corruption. This means the new earth will have no slavery or corruption of any kind. I mean, we like to go up to North Carolina sometimes in October or Tennessee and see the leaves changing, but you do realize what that is. They're dying. They fall to the ground and they become what people that sell bags of this stuff to us called mulch when it's actually decay. And that's what's happened. But that will not happen in the new earth. As a matter of fact, John tells us there is the tree of life planted alongside the river in heaven. So be, be encouraged, there's a river in heaven. I think it's clear. I, I don't remember if he says that or not. But anyway, this tree of life has 12 different fruit on it and each one comes into uh, maturity every month. 
So use your imagination. You walk out there, it's got apples on it. Oh, it's beautiful. Apples everywhere. You wait 30 days, you walk out there, there's oranges on it. The same tree. How is that possible? Ask God. All will be new and stay new. You know how it is when you buy an automobile. It has that smell. Boy, if they could bottle that, you could put it in a 57 Chevy and people would think it was brand new. Wouldn't it? But no, you buy a new vehicle and in six months or less, it's not new anymore. But everything will be new. And it will stay new, even our bodies. And I know some of you are jumping up and down inside saying, what a day that'll be when the body stays the same all the time. You say, Brother Keith, how old will we be in heaven? I don't know. But it doesn't matter because however old you are there, you won't get any older. Of course, you're not going to get any younger either, but that's okay. You won't need to. No decay, no death, no decomposition, no corruption. All will be new and stay new. No sand spurs, no weeds, no thistles. Folks, this will not happen until the children of God are glorified. That's what Paul means when he says the glorious freedom of the children of God. All creation groans for its relief, relief and release from slavery to corruption. But let's go on. There's one more. Paul gets more personal. Number three, considering our future. Look at verse 23. Not only that, don't you love it when he says that? That means there's more coming. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves grown within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, with the redemption of our body. You say, well, wait a minute, I thought we were redeemed. We even sing songs about that. Redeemed, how I love to proclaim it. Yeah, but what Paul is saying there, our redemption is not final. That doesn't mean that you still got to suffer, you know, the effects of sin as far as standing before God. No, that's not what he's saying. He's talking about when our redemption is finally realized before all living things. Three times in this verse in the New American Standard, Paul mentions the personal ourselves. It's very personal. We, like creation, groan for, for release from the curse of sin. And Paul gives us two examples of what we can look forward to. These things, in the mind of God, they are final, but in the mind of creation, they're not. Let me explain that to you as we go. Number one, our adoption. Now, you know that when a person is adopted, when a child is adopted, that there is a process you go through. And you can ask those parents, if they're in the first stage, the second stage, so forth, you know, what stage are you in? Where we're almost to the end. They're not quite there yet. Everything's done. Everything looks good. It's just a matter of time. And that's exactly what the apostle is saying about our adoption. It's in the mind of God it's already done. We are his children. We get the inheritance he's promised us, and I'll talk about that in a minute. But notice this adoption is as sons. Why would Paul do that? Were there not women alive back then? Well, certainly there were. We are all, male and female, considered by God as heirs. Heirs of Christ. Everything that Jesus has, we will have. We have it. But in the first century, it was only the adult son who received the inheritance. But God calls us all adult sons. You say, well, wait a minute. We're not the firstborn. What did Paul just say here? Uh-oh. Not only that, but we also who have the what? First fruits of the Spirit? 
In the mind of God, every born again believer is the firstborn. They get the inheritance. What is our inheritance, you say? Well, I could go on and on and on about that, and we'd be here till tomorrow, but I'm not going to do that. I'll just give you the cliff notes. Everything Jesus has. There you have it. Use your imagination. Secondly, not only our adoption, but our redemption. And I know I mentioned this a while ago. Are we not already redeemed? But that will not be realized until we live on the new earth. We will not understand our adoption or our redemption until we see our eternal home. You have been away from home. I know you have. Most of us have traveled somewhere. And there's nothing like coming home. And I know I've talked to senior adults who say there's no place has my toothbrush but my home. Well, that's good. But there's no place like home. But can you imagine when we finally reach the new earth? Then will truly be home. The old song says, this world is not my home. I'm just a passing through. That's what we all are if we're born again. And then number four, Paul encourages believers to hope for final redemption in verses 24 and 25. Paul mentions hope. And I know people have different ideas about what hope is, you know. I hope it doesn't rain. Or uh, I hope I get a new car soon, or I hope, I hope, I hope. And But if you actually saw that and knew it was going to happen, you wouldn't hope for it, would you? So hope is a good thing. Never give up hope. Paul says hope that is seen is not hope. Hope that is unseen is what he's talking about. We eagerly wait for what we cannot see. Scripture tells us about our future home. And for those that come up to you and say, well, the Bible says we will never fully understand what that place is like. We won't know till we get there. Here's a verse for them. I'm sorry, here's two verses for them. I'm going to read the first one, and then I will get into the second one. It's in 1 Corinthians 2, verses 9, verse 9, and then verse 10. But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the heart of man the things which God has prepared for those who love him. And everybody says, that says it right there. It hasn't even entered into our mind what that place is going to be like. Well, look at the next verse. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit. For the Spirit searches all things. Yes, the deep things of God. So, folks, we can use our imagination to some point. And I don't think John was mistaken. I believe he was thoroughly indoctrinated in Christianity when he wrote the revelation of Jesus Christ. And I certainly believe he was under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit when he said, a new earth. It's like this one, but it's new. It'd be similar to this one but without the effects of sin. As the new covenant states, we will all know the Lord. We won't have to go out and tell somebody about Jesus because they'll know about him too. Now let me answer some questions about the new earth. I'm not going to get into all of it because there's lots and lots and lots that will help you when you think about this place we will all spend eternity if we are children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Uh, number one, and I've been asked this, will we be in an eternal church service? <laughs> no. As a matter of fact, when you look at Revelation, you find out there's not even a temple in heaven because the lamb 
is the temple. There won't be a gathering place other than the new Jerusalem that we go. Our very existence, no matter what we do or where we do it, will glorify and praise God. Because you wouldn't be there if he hadn't saved you, ransomed you, redeemed you. Will we get bored Well, that's a hard question to answer because what bores some people doesn't bore me. Give me a Bible and a concordance and something to write on and I'm fine. I can spend all the time I have just reading and digging and trying to understand this great God we serve. But to somebody else, that's boring. Well, see, this very question assumes that God is bored. <laughs> and I think you know the answer to that one. We were at the ball game yesterday, and a butterfly with his wing, each wing was about that wide, was flitting around inside the stands. And I said to myself, hey, you need to get out of here. Somebody will kill you. Because you're not supposed to be here. But you look at the colors on that butterfly. Do you think God is boring? If you do, I've got a couple of places for you to look. You know what a warthog is? You know what a platypus is? Do you know what an elephant is? Do you know what a brown deer chick looks like? And think of everything in between those. You think God is boring? He's going to have a place for us. We'll be there two weeks and say, ho oh, hum. My question is this, to those that think heaven will be boring. How could God not be bored with us? I've been to North Carolina. I have been to Colorado. Is gazing at the mountains boring? Is going to the beach and seeing the waves and hearing, is that boring? Well, it might be to someone, but it certainly isn't me. Folks, let me tell you, you're not going to get bored because God is not boring. This idea of being bored simply comes from, I don't have anything to do. And folks, if you get bored, come to my house. I got lots of stuff. I'll give you something to do. And you won't be bored anymore. Especially young people. I'm bored. Well, let me give you a job. Oh, no. Well, you're not bored then. I could probably preach a whole sermon, but it wouldn't be boring. <laughs> and then some people have said, have asked the question, will we have a house to live in? I know the King James says in my father's house are many mansions. Well, folks, you don't put mansions in a house. I'm sorry, that came from the Latin. But the idea is Jesus tells us that there are many dwelling places in his father's house. You say like apartments? Well, yeah, kind of like that. We will each have one of those places. But this is what's exciting about that. We will be able to have friends over for a meal. Oh, we're going to eat in heaven? Well, are you serious? We've been eating our whole existence. Of course we will. It's not going to hurt us. There won't be any overeating. You'll know exactly when to quit. That's my problem. I don't know when to quit. We'll have, be able to have friends over. People that perhaps we live next door to that went to the same church or something like that in heaven. We'll be able to rest there. And you know how much fun it is trying to rest 
when people don't want you to rest. It's like going to the hospital. And ladies, those of you who are nurses, I mean no offense by this whatsoever. But they often tell you, we well, you got you here so you can rest. And then they interrupt you every hour. That's okay. You got to do your job to get us home where we really can rest. But listen to what Hebrews 4 verse 9 says. There remains therefore a rest for the people of God. True rest. This is what's exciting about this to me though. Listen real carefully what I'm about to say. I can ask the Lord Jesus Christ, would you come to my house and eat with me? And guess what he will say? I'll be there at 6. Can you imagine sitting down to eat with the Lord of glory, the king of the universe? I promise you, I'll ask him to bless the meal. I'm sure most of you have heard about the missionaries that were killed. Four missionaries were killed in South America by the Alka Indians. And if you've seen the movie, is it the tip of the spear or the end of the spear? You find out that one of the very persons that speared Nate Saint to death has been converted to the Christian faith. God gloriously saved him. He was asked, his name is Minkayat. He was asked, what are you going to do when you see Nate, heaven, Nate Saint heaven? You know what he said? I'm going to run to Nate Saint and throw my arms around him and thank him for bringing Jesus Christ's gospel to my people. And you know what Nate Saint will do? He will welcome him to heaven. That doesn't say it all. It comes pretty close. You will notice that when you be, read Revelation that God says, I'll wipe away every tear from their eyes. That's, per, that's future. He hasn't done that yet. I have a pretty good idea that in our reunion before we settle on the new earth, there's going to be a lot of tears, Jed. There's going to be people having to get things right with someone in their church that they didn't get things right with until it's too late. Maybe you got bad feelings against someone in your family. I can identify with that. I certainly can. And I have to work hard because I am a child of God at squelling what wants to come up and let itself be known at a family get-together when the Lord Jesus Christ Spirit comes to me and says, Keith, I will be with you when you preach from the pulpit. I will be with you when you share the gospel with someone. But if you get on to this family member, I will leave you alone. And that scares me to death. Don't wait to get things right. Do it now. Two times in the book of Acts, the Apostle Paul says, My conscience is clear. Folks, I'm not going to ask you if your conscience is clear. I think you know the answer to that. If it's not, why not? Do something about it. Because you and I both know we are not promised Monday morning. We're not promised Sunday evening. There's a whole lot more to heaven when we think. There's not going to be bad feelings there. God's going to tell us, hey, if you've got a problem with your brother or sister in Christ, you get it taken care of before you go to the new heaven because if you don't, you're not going. There's much more to heaven than we think. God is there, Jesus is there, and the place is beyond our wildest dreams there are aspects of heaven that we most likely cannot understand but we will when we get there 
it would be like those moments. Oh, that's what he meant. Now let me ask you, have you made arrangements to live there? Only through Jesus can you make your reservation. And I'm telling you from Scripture, Jesus said, if you'll come to me, I'll take you. It doesn't matter what you've done. He can forgive you that. He did me. And it's a full-time job for him just dealing with me. No, but that day on the cross when Jesus said it is finished, that's what he meant. I have paid the price. Nothing is left to be done. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for passages like this that help us see there is a better world, a better life. And Lord, it's not just that. But there are times on this earth when we get together with family or friends and we think to ourselves while we're in the midst of perhaps eating together and talking about different things, it just can't get any better than this. But Father, that's not true. It will. It can. It does. And it's times like that when we say it can't get any better, it ought to make us think about our heavenly home. It is better. Lord, I pray you use this today to draw people to yourself. That's my prayer. In Jesus' name I pray it. Amen. Would you stand?